Friends, we welcome you to this conversation uh, from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. I'm Spencer Fluman, the uh, Institute's Executive Director, and I am thrilled to be here with Dr. Christopher Blythe, uh, who has written a marvelous, fascinating, and brilliant book, Terrible Revolution, Latter-day Saints and the American Apocalypse. And uh, Chris, we're here to talk about it. You Thank ready to you. talk about it? Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, Chris Blythe comes to us um, uh, from uh, Florida State University in terms of your uh, PhD. And this project, I gather, started as a doctoral dissertation there. Yeah. So I want to I wanna ask first off, what drew you to the topic originally? Oh, th I think that's a, an interesting question. Yeah. So. Of course, it's about apocalypticism. Yeah. And so I grew up, I was born in 1981, and I grew up in the 80s. And I can remember in uh, 1987, maybe 1988, um, a family member had read um, a very popular um, apocalyptic evangelical book. You know, mm -hmm. there were several of them. This was Late Great Planet Earth. Yeah. Um, and there was another related one. Um, but they came to me and they told me about the apocalypse and uh, it shook my world. I'm an eight-year-old kid or a seven-year-old kid and uh, this is the first time I'd ever heard about the end of the world and it was presented in a certain way. So when I became a Latter-day Saint five years later, that, that idea was still, um, still something I was interested in, particularly how people yeah. over the years I, since becoming a Latter-day Saint, I realized that interpretations of the apocalypse really vary. Um, even in a religious tradition, largely like Christianity, but specifically like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and so one of the first things I realized in reading the Book of Mormon at 13 before I was converged to the church was um, the Book of Revelation is just throughout this Book of Mormon. Um, and so that's kind of been an interest of mine. So when I showed up to graduate school and my professors also had an interest in apocalypticism and sort of the, the folklore of the apocalypse, the stories told by regular lay people. Yeah. Um, I thought, let me jump on this. This is really something interesting. Well, your response gives us a, a couple of places to take off on. The first, I, I, I think, uh, we'll just have you kind of dig in on the Latter-day Saint tradition and apocalypticism. Talk to us about kind of how apocalypticism figured in the, the kind of founding generation. Um, give us a, an overview. Sure. Yeah, I think um, the Book of Mormon as a text is, uh, has apocalypses within it. It's the story of several major destructions. You know, from the beginning, we have a prophet who's fleeing Jerusalem to the New World, um, aware, warning people that an apocalypse is going to happen there, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, and fleeing to safety in a place where they can be protected, the Promised Land. Um, and I think that motif mm -hmm. was essential to early Latter-day Saints, um, both with the prophecies they emphasized from the Bible, um, but also the Book of Mormon. And so early Latter-day Saint missionaries went out and they expected the apocalypse in their lifetimes imminent. Um, and their goal was to bring people to protection, gather with the saints, leave Babylon. Um, and the book, really what I try to look at is not only those major conversations that prophets and these early apostles were having, but really everyday Latter-day Saints who were also talking about these things, but also experiencing them. So the Book of Mormon's written, and then there's a whole rich visionary literature comes out of that early tradition. I noticed, yeah, in fact, I, I noticed in the book that you pay a, attention to what leaders are saying, but you go to great lengths to try and unearth what you refer to in the book as vernacular religion. So for, for non-scholars or for scholars that aren't aware of the term, unpack what you, what you mean there with vernacular religion and how that relates to the Latter-day Saints and their thinking about end times. Absolutely. Vernacular religion is what term is used among folklore scholars. In religion scholars or historians, you usually use the term lived religion. Um, it means the same thing. So instead of looking at an official story um, you know, what do latter, what's the official doctrine of the Latter-day Saints? What do Latter-day Saints really believe? It looks at interpretation. Mm. Um, so what's religion look like on the ground? And it doesn't prioritize or preference any one given story, but looks at variance and how those, 
how those, that lived experience plays into these narratives. And so I think there's been a lot of scholars who have pointed out that we need to move into directions of lived religion and vernacular religion um, and studying Latter-day Saints. But we're still working on it. Yeah. Um, and so I thought one of the great ways to try to make an intervention into that conversation was to, to look at this tradition where we, you know, Latter-day Saints know about this sort of vernacular folk tradition of apocalyptic belief. They know, you know, when I mention this book, I'll have individuals call me up and say, Chris, the White Horse prophecy isn't real. Don't you know that? And I'll say, well, well I mean, Latter-day Saints believed it for several years. It was circulated. There's dozens of copies of the church history library. Um, I think there's something interesting about that that we can dig into. Um, the reason I picked the term vernacular religion rather than lived religion is because uh, I've had a love affair with folklore over the mm. past decade, yeah. um, which, which emphasizes um, which, which really emphasizes the voice of the individual person. Yeah. So in this case, um, I, try to, I try to take very seriously the way early Latter-day Saints shared their experiences or told their narratives um, in a way that maybe some of the major thinkers, such as Bob Orsi and lived religion, don't. So in the short term, vernacular religion means folklore of religion, um, but that idea of interpretation, there's no, we're not trying to come to a, a sort of true official thing. We're on the ground um, trying to understand people in the way that these ideas and stories are really dynamic. They change and they answer different issues depending on the decade. Well, and, and this, is, this is helpful. I mean, we're, we're seated here in our new Maxwell Institute space in BYU's Westview building. We're seated in front of a, a spectacular um, representation of a founding vision for the Latter-day Saints Absolutely. by Kirk Richards uh, as our backdrop. And so you've, you, you've sketched out for us a kind of official um, apocalyptic tradition from church leaders and then this kind of tradition of folklore where individual Latter-day Saints both comment on and interact with and also, but also have their own visions to, to, to kind of interact with that official tradition. Do you have some favorite folk visions, we might call them, to point to that you, that you talk about in the book? Absolutely. Um, and what a great interpretive piece. So this is how a lot of the things I talk about is how people relate to that official story or that a major vision and how it gets interpreted on the ground in different ways. Yeah. And so I love this as an example, right? So J. Kirk Richards has Joseph facing in an opposite direction. What does that mean? He's added the angels as part of almost the pillar of light coming with it. Yeah. Um, a lot of commentary on visions. And so a lot of the book is, is thinking about how people have responded to those founding visions. If I was gonna think of a favorite, um, I think there are several, but one of my favorites um, is from a guy named Newman Bulkley, and he lived um, down south in Utah, and he wrote a prophecy that was very popular in the 1880s. Um, you know, we were, Latter-day Saints were nervous about invasions, right? Yeah. We had 1857, the Utah War, 1886, um, excuse me, in the 1880s, we're having uh, federal marshals coming out and arresting um, individuals living plural marriage. Yeah. So Newbul Newman Bulkley writes a prophecy similar to some of the others at the time, but that positions some of the themes that we think of as the Battle of Armageddon. Yeah. You know, in the Bible, it's set literally in Armageddon in, in Palestine. And now this story is getting rewritten. It, or his vision or his dream, sees this story taking place in Salt Lake City. Mm. There's armies surrounding the, the temple square. Um, and ultimately at this moment where the army has gathered all of their explosives and ammunition to fight against the saints, um, Joseph is mm. resurrected to lead them. Um, and so Joseph and Jesus appear, they defeat the saints' enemies, they then plan together in the, the towers of the Salt Lake Temple, and then, like in lots of these visions, they lead the saints back to Jackson County, all together in this large caravan mm. led by you know, Jesus Christ and Joseph Smith. I mean, there's a reason this vision is really appealing, right? It's a, um, enemies are thwarted, 
Um, it's certainly sort of a, a fantasy to be able to be part of that moment in time of finally getting back to Jackson County, but also seeing the Savior himself and, Jesus, and Joseph Smith. Um, really powerful scene. And that Newman Bulkley and a few others are, you know, sometimes I played with the idea of saying there's a folk canon. There's yeah. certain visions that always show up. And Newman Bulkley's one of them. There's a lot of others that are equally well known, um, or more so, like the White Horse Prophecy and the Horseshoe Prophecy and um, the Yellow Dog Prophecy. Um, There's all, all these colors of, in these prophecies. That's interesting, huh? It, all these animals. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's true. Um, and we can come up with clever names for them and so on. Um, and I think it's interesting how long they've endured. This Newman Bulkley one has endured less. So if you were in the 1880s, you would know this prophecy maybe mm. in, into the 1950s. Um, and then, you know, in the, in the 1930s, the last time I've seen it really discussed is in a, a pamphlet that argues we're not discussing this prophecy anymore because we no longer fear the army. But remember, the army's the bad guys, right? Interesting. So, fascinating moment that's kind of preserved in that piece. You've, uh, you, you've hinted at this, and you, and you take this up in the book some, but I'm, I'm interested in the function of these visions and stories that get repeated and changed. Is this about, you, you mentioned just now hope. Are these stories about hope? Are they about fear? Are they about managing um, the unpredictability of, of events? Are they about um, kind of watching a, a set of, of scriptural themes and a kind of mapping them onto the world? Is it reinforced? Mm-hmm. All of those things. All of those things. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things I focus on in the 19th century, it's doing a lot. It's when you share one of these apocalyptic visions, it's uh, urging people to move to the Rocky Mountains, right? We're building a community. You don't want to stay here. It's not safe. Um, and of course, that's a real fair, right? There's persecution out, um, outside of the Rocky Mountains. There's yeah. um, fear of disease spread. The Civil War is going to happen. All sorts of events where Latter-day Saints believe they're going to form this utopia. And as a result, um, some of these more graphic images are, aren't designed necessarily to create fear. Yeah. You only need to be afraid if you're going to stay out there. If you're coming here, you're safe. So it's uh, encouraging you to do something. In most cases, I think these visions, as they're being told, is designed to push against um, who the saints believe are their enemies at a given time. So almost to, almost to maintain or create boundaries oh, in that sense, then yeah, yeah, to push against and to promise. Yeah. Broadly, you know, I think the work apocalyptic does is it tells a people who consider themselves oppressed that better days are going to happen, and and. You know, definition of apocalyptic is there's going to be a, a change of powers. So the people who are oppressed are going to eventually be the leaders or protected and so on. Yeah. Um, and those that are the oppressor will find themselves at the bottom of society or unsafe, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's doing a, a lot of those images. One thing I noticed um, is that a lot of this material um, focuses on... Um, uh, at the same time that it's focused on last day's events, it's also pointing to the saints to their everyday duty, right? So mm. there's a lot of emphasis on temples, um, you know, the centers of the Latter-day Saint. There's lots of emphasis on missionary work, um, on taking care of families, right? Uh, as you're pushing against others, the, the Gentiles, um, they're always presented as not taking care of their families, uh, abusing women, um, abusing children. And Latter-day Saints, are portrayed as sort of saviors to these individuals. Mm-hmm. I kind of call it duty in a kind of interesting way. Then, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you've. I mean, we've we've talked now about the the way in which this kind of folk apocalypticism um, creates a, a a sense of coherence within uh, the Latter Day Saint community at various times and in various ways. Mm-hmm. But you describe, too, in the book, instances where visions or um, apocalyptic literature from outside the Latter-day Saint community finds its way in. Could you, could you describe that dynamic as well? Because that, that seems to me as, as a slightly different thing, where you're kind of incorporating visionary traditions from outside and kind of yeah. bringing them within the Latter-day Saint kind of community. Oh, thank you. I, I think that is a great question. Um, 
You know, when I look at these, you go to the church history library, you dig in the archives, you can find tons of notebooks where people have recorded visions in them, sometimes their own, sometimes a revelation from Joseph Smith that wasn't yet canonized. Um, and alongside those, you find older visions um, that people in the Northeast were sharing. You know, mm -hmm. you might find a quote from Nostradamus at later points. Um, I almost always see a vision from Timothy Walker, mm -hmm. um, this early American who's predicting, um, you know, sort of devastating apocalypses in the area, um, destructions and so on. Early Latter-day Saints were really, really struck by this, this vision. But the one that I think is most interesting um, that's had a recent return among Latter-day Saints is the vision of George Washington. Mm. Um, really a Civil War vision written by a journalist who um, was very open that it was a fiction, um, that he was writing it as a, a romance or a, a, a short novel to, uh, to arouse patriotic sentiment. Um, but when that made it, it was written in 1863, I believe. When that made it to Utah in 1867, uh, people didn't understand the sort of fictive dimension of it, and so it was quickly embraced. It was published as, as an authentic, as an authentic vision thing. of George Washington. And why wouldn't it be? It was George Washington's uh, vision at Valley Forge. George Washington is going to. Um, he, he's concerned about the fate of the nation or the fledgling nation, and so he has this vision of an angel who tells him there's going to be three great trials in America. The first is the revolution, the second is the civil war, and the people will be united again, but um, there will be a sort of invasion on the United States. And after this invasion happens, um, the United States will have to, to become unified in a way that gets re the return of God's favor, and then God will fight their battles through angels. Very handy in the midst of the Civil War yes. with the nation pulling apart, a, right. a kind of divine injunction toward unity. Absolutely, and this angel actually has union written on his head. Um, so fascinating image. Um, he, uh, this gets picked up amongst Latter-day Saints, and it plays with those other ideas that are already there. So Joseph, um, I talk about a vision that he had or a dream he had that Orson Hyde would interpret and say, you know, one day you're going to be a general that's going to be able to fight the invaders of the United States, right? Mm. Um, early Latter-day Saints sometimes talked about sort of their military help yeah. they could offer the, offer the United States. Sometimes the U.S. military is attacking saints. And sometimes the saints are helping the military defeat outside invaders. And... Uh, Latter-day Saints picked right up on that. Again, this is almost like the Battle of Armageddon, but brought to American soil. There's going to be great invaders here. And those angels now, instead of literal angels from the other side, are going to be faithful Latter-day Saints who are going to help the nation um, fight the bad guys. This is, uh, Interesting. This is one of the most well-known American visions broadly. Um, and so it kind of makes sense that Latter-day Saints would grab it and hold on to it. It also reminds us that some of these visions seem and certainly were portrayed as unpatriotic, but when Latter-day Saints viewed it, they had a, their own way of thinking about American identity and patriotism that they're really holding on to. And so, and, and you're, you're describing here a, 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 not a, a static, um, same way of Latter-day Saints engaging visionary culture or apocalyptic, things, apocalyptic themes over time, mm -hmm. but one that kind of goes up and down and changes with circumstances. Um, map out for us um, what happens, for instance, to Latter-day Saints when uh, statehood changes the game for Latter-day Saints, and what happens when the, the, the kind of fiery folk apocalypticism no longer really works, yeah. and so there's kind of a, a, a downward kind of trajectory for folk apocalypticism, at, at least among mainstream Latter-day Saints. I think that's right. Um, you know, so statehood shows up in 1896. Um, immediately um, at, with statehood, George Q. Cannon writes an interesting entry in his journal. He says, um, statehood, you know, so excited about it. And he says, now I understand how the prophecies are going to be fulfilled, right? How could we fulfill these prophecies of saving the Constitution if we were outside the United States? You know, those guys thought they were separatists, but we really need to save it from within. Mm. And that really... It wasn't his comment, but, but statehood itself 
set a trajectory and how we would think about last day's events. That would, you know, we'd, we'd try some different paths, but ultimately um, a sort of insider perspective of how this would work. We're going to help the nation and so on, and the nation's going to be protected. Um, if you were a church leader at this time, there became a growing concern for visions being shared by individuals, often because of that concern about appearing anti-American. And this wasn't just, you know, this wasn't a fringe concern. This is showing up in all the newspapers, right? If yeah. you were going to make an argument that said Latter-day Saints weren't good Americans, you might point to Mount Meadows Massacre, or you might point to polygamy, but it's really this lens of anti-Americanism brought on by an idea that the country will perish, right? Yeah. Um, a promise of apocalypse is actually pointed at America. And uh, so people begin to be concerned about this. And ultimately, we have a series of statements where church leaders say, uh, this prophecy is incorrect. Be careful when your neighbor shares their own vision. It's really just for them. It's not meant to be spread amongst everyday Latter-day Saints. And um, A kind of public-private yeah. distinction and kind of moved into the private sphere, in other That's words. Right. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So now when we're looking for folklore examples moving into the 20th century, we, we might find some examples, and certainly pamphlets are published. There's, a, there's an effort of retrenching, saying, hey, we need to look at these visions. Um, but for the most part, people begin to turn just towards Doctrine and Covenants or the Bible or official uh, apostolic stories. So folk prophecies begin to be distributed unofficially. And so really, we might have a, we might say this is a, a moment where we have less, but actually um, they're circulating more and more. And now, now they're actually folk, right? Before they were, you could publish them in the newspaper and people would be excited about them. They were amongst everyday believers are participating, but now there's no sort of printed outlet for the most part. So people are actually making copies of these visions and um, handing them to others. So we can still see all that happening. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's happening amongst family members, amongst close friends, um, you know, and this goes all the way to the present. It happens at Boy Scout camps and missionary companions and uh, great grandpa telling a story. All those sorts of things are where we find the survivals of this apocalyptic folk tradition. So yeah, so it's not that Latter-day Saints ditched the idea of visionary culture in any mm -hmm. sense. It's the, the, the way those are distributed and talked about and in some ways contained, in other ways explained, it's isn't, changed. It's isn't that great? Time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Boyd K. Packer once gave a talk on when you should share a vision. Yeah. And he would say, uh, you know, if someone else, you should always be careful, you should only listen to when the Spirit tells you to do it. If someone else has shared some miraculous vision that they've had, um, it's okay if you're impressed to share it, as long as you've seen them share it in a large audience themselves. So sort of respect that trust yeah. and sanctity of the vision. But then he says, you definitely should share it with your family members. You should record it in your journal so that they have um, an opportunity to see your witness. I mean, it's fascinating, right? Because Latter-day Saints believe that these gifts of the Spirit still exist. Um, I've had several students who've wanted to write about the decline of gifts of the Spirit in the church, decline of visions and dreams. And on two occasions, I have students come back to me and say, I, I don't buy the thesis anymore. I don't think they've declined. <laughs> right, I don't think they've declined. I think yeah. they've, something's happened, right? Because this family has these experiences and it turns out this prophet does claim to have a vision and so on. Yeah, well, what didn't get into the book? Uh, give it, you're going to be writing articles on this topic for the rest of your career, we hope. Mm -hmm. uh, this is fascinating reading. What didn't make it into the book? What, what did you not have room for? Just give yes. us a, a teaser for what we might see in the future. Do you know, I, uh, I started working at the Maxwell Institute here, and I had a wonderful project I'm working about on Book of Mormon geography. Yeah. And then one day, uh, I discovered this woman, I'm making revisions on the book, her name's Lorona Wilson. Mm. And she's a dressmaker in Cache Valley, Utah. She started her own dressmaking college there. Um, she was also a disabled woman. And she had, I can't think of a more prolific visionary. She had wow. this experience where uh, she had hurt herself and had to go to the hospital in a brief coma. And um, she began to just write all these visions. And 
it, it was the, the strangest experience of, you know, discovering this woman and then going out to an archive and all of a sudden finding letters that discuss her and uh, oh, heading up to Utah yeah. State and the great Latter-day Saint folklorist, um, Burt Wilson and, uh, and the Fifes, another famous folklore names, um, they had collected materials from her. Someone had given the, the archive there under Burt Wilson a, a collection of her visions. And so it just felt like they were all coming together. And I thought, I, I mentioned her once, and I think, you know, you have to wrestle. I, there's a whole book of material here, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so, right. Tough um, decision of what to include and yeah, what to expand. So I decided to hold off on her, but I so amazing she's this disabled dressmaker she starts a pacifist organization called uh, the women's peace army in salt lake that's covered in the newspaper she eventually inspires uh her, after her death a woman writes a science fiction novel one of the first uh female before orson scott card a female latter-day saint uh science fiction author is writing based on her experiences with this visionary and this visionary's visions of other worlds. She's writing a science fiction novel about it. So fantastic just story. Just such interesting material. So that's what I would say the biggest thing I left out. Well, we'll look forward to that. <laughs> we'll look forward to, to more work on, uh, on that coming. Uh, Chris, you've written uh, a, a brilliant and fascinating work. Where, where can people get it? Where should people get it if they're oh. interested in, in, uh, in Terrible Revolution? You know, I think if any BYU students are watching, I think they should take advantage of the digital copy in the library. I mean, it's it's wonderful. We're in an era where students at BYU can really access a lot of material nice. um, without having to put down a lot of money. If you want to buy a copy, I think you should go to Oxford University. <laughs> but you Press. don't want to pay full price. That's right. Then where do you go? Yeah. So I want to give you the discount code. <laughs> and this is AAFLYG6. And that'll give it, you get a discount that takes off 30%. Fantastic. Um, Good. Yeah. Or wait for the paperback. Special, special for those uh, watching this uh, Maxwell Institute conversation. Uh, Dr. Blythe, thank you. Oh, uh, thanks, Spencer. Appreciate uh, being with you. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining with us. Uh, we appreciate uh, you looking in on some of the, the great research and writing uh, done here at the Maxwell Institute. Thanks. <laughs>